How's everyone doing? Okay, one more time. Good morning, everyone. See, I have to have that call and response, you know? I have to have the, some, some feedback there. Uh, my name is Congresswoman Karen Bass, and I am from Los Angeles, and I wanted to welcome everyone here today for a very important morning, a very important panel. We have expert witnesses that we're gonna be hearing from in just a minute, and I wanna thank someone from my city and also my district uh, who is going to be moderating our panel, uh, Judge Groman. But we'll get to that in just a second because I wanna bring up in just a minute uh, one of the leaders in the House of Representatives and one of the reasons why I really enjoy serving in Congress is because I get to serve alongside folks like Representative Bobby Scott. Um, juvenile justice is a absolutely critical issue for us and you know, I, I feel like this moment in history, there's a little window of time where I wanna just rush through and, and open that window up all the way and say now is the time to really look at our criminal justice system and change it from being a system of injustice to a system of justice, especially for folks like all of us in the room. And while we're engaging in this discussion in our country, we have to make sure that girls and women are included in this discussion because our needs are different as we are in the criminal justice system and go through that process. And so that is one of the goals of today is to begin to look at that issue. So I wanna bring up uh, Representative Bobby Scott, who is from Virginia. I've been in Congress now for five years, but I've known of Representative Scott for many years before that because I followed the legislation uh, that he has done over the years called the Youth Promise Act, and I'm sure he's gonna share uh, that with you in a minute. But um, he is the ranking Democrat on the Education and Workforce Committee, and that is the committee where these issues come up. So we are very lucky to have a leader like him who gets it and who has been leading the way for many years, Representative Bobby Scott. Thank you, Karen, and what we're lucky to have in Congress are people like you. Uh, Karen Bass has been a leader. She was Speaker of the House in California working on these kinds of issues, uh, particularly people that are often overlooked, like foster care youth, uh, making sure they can get on the right track and stay on the right track, and that's really a challenge we have. Uh, we have a criminal justice system that, um, uh, criminal justice policy, where we just wait until people get off track join a gang, mess up, get caught, and then we get into a bidding war as to who can uh, impose the most egregious sentence. And the slogans and sound bites rule the day, you know, three strikes and you're out, uh, 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 things like mandatory minimum sentences, and get it to rhyme, it's great. Like, um, if you do the adult time, you do the, you do the crime, you do the adult time. All of those slogans and sound bites and waiting until it's too late have got us to the point where we lock up a higher portion of our population than any country on earth by far. A few researchers looked at our incarceration rate and concluded that we're actually adding to crime, not uh, reducing crime, because we're messing up so many families, you got so many people with felony records, you're just wasting so much money that you're adding to crime, not doing anything to reduce crime. One of the um, uh, problems that uh, Karen has been addressing and noticing is one of the uh, Population, one of the population uh, that, that's adding to the over-incarceration are young women. Uh, and we can do something about it. We know what works, we know what doesn't work. If you take a proactive approach, get young people on the right track and keep them on the right track, they don't get in trouble to begin with. That's, you mentioned the Youth Promise Act, that's a bill that we're still working on uh, that will uh, require cities to come together and make a decision that they're gonna be serious about crime, not slogans and sound bites, but an evidence-based approach to actually do something about crime. And we know that we can deal with young, young, young women uh, in the prison uh, system if we take an evidence-based approach. We know what works, we know what doesn't work, and we need to make sure that we uh, treat them uh, right. We have preventive uh, measures so they don't get in trouble, and when they do get in trouble, we uh, treat them appropriately so they're less likely to get in trouble again. And that's why this forum is so important. Uh, we need to get ahead of it before it gets worse, and you've got a great leader in this issue, in this uh, effort with uh, Representative Karen Bass. And Karen, so I'm so uh, delighted to be here. I'm not going to be able to stay very long, but I hope to stay as long as I can. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Representative Scott. Uh, so let's get down to business. I want to introduce our moderator today, Judge Donna Quigley Groman, has been a judicial officer since 1997. She is presently assigned to the Los Angeles County Juvenile Delinquency Court as a supervising judge of the Kenyan Juvenile Justice Center in South Los Angeles. And her prior assignments include criminal and juvenile dependency. Judge Groman was named the California Judges Association Juvenile Court Judge of the Year for 2012. Won't you join me in welcoming Judge Groman. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's just such a great pleasure to be here, and I want to thank Congresswoman Bass for this opportunity uh, to be here with everybody today. Uh, we have uh, an esteemed panel. Uh, to my immediate left is uh, Judge Joan Beyer from the Circuit Court uh, Family Division in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And um, 19 years on the bench. Uh, she's a published author. She's an expert on trauma, truancy, and homelessness issues. Um, and has a lot to offer us in terms of the work that she's done uh, in the court, uh, especially with, with girls. Uh, to uh, her left is Ashe Jackson, who is from Lamert Park, close to where I live. Um, she uh, was involved in the Juvenile Justice Center at age 12 and uh, currently is um, the co-chair of the Anti-Recidivism Co Coalition. She is a USC graduate, a BA in English Literature and perhaps on her way to law school with a focus with a focus on criminal justice and uh, rehabilitation. Next, we have uh, Sonia, Jack Sonia Brown, who um, uh, was in the foster care system at an early age, uh, went through a, a constant movement uh, as a young person, um, was arrested at a some point in time for uh, school-based behavior. Uh, she was placed into uh, placement at Boys Town, AWOLD, and I understand uh, was picked up on a warrant that was not recalled and spent some very uh, horrific time in adult jail, and we will be hearing about that from her. But she has a BA and an MA, um, works for Boys Town in uh, dealing with youth who are transitioning um, out of the foster care system. Uh, next, we have uh, Haley Marie Caesar. Uh, Haley's 17 years old, um, has been through the system, the foster care system. A uh, victim of physical abuse, was arrested for violence against her mother, was placed on probation, went into placement, has had to deal with uh, numerous mental health issues, but she is here today as a speaker from the PACE program and here to tell us about her experience and how she was able to overcome all of her challenges. And uh, she will be a senior in high school next year, graduating and th then on to college. <laughs> so I am here today. Um, I started as a young lawyer in 1980. Um, I started uh, working in the juvenile field as a lawyer in both the uh, dependency, which is our child welfare system and the delinquency which I'm hoping to change the name of our delinquency system to juvenile justice because I can't stand that very antiquated uh, phrase. But at any rate, um, this was my love, working with kids and families. And so when I um, saw new judges being assigned to our dependency court who really didn't want to be there as their first assignment and were doing everything possible to get to a different assignment, 
and not really delving into the cases like they should and becoming familiar with the families, I thought, because I was committed as a lawyer to working with families and kids, that I could do a better job because I was committed to being in that field for the rest of my career. So I applied and became a referee, which is a form of a judge in, in Los Angeles. And since 1997, with the exception of four years in adult court, um, have spent my career uh, working in the juvenile court. I, I have to say that there is absolutely no joy in working in the adult system and that really where we can accomplish things is in the juvenile court system where rehabilitation is a focus. And things are shifting now. I know when I first came in, uh, they looked at me as somebody who came from child welfare and was not tough on crime and was um, unfortunately uh, concerned about the best interests of our youth. And that was a bad thing. But, but things have really been changing in the juvenile justice system, and I think it's because of the research that's been done on the development of the teenage brain. People are realizing that it takes until age 25 to mature, and that we can't hold young people accountable like we do adults, because they're not many adults. They're young people who are still developing, they don't have the same kind of impulse control or reasoning processes that adults have. And I th see a shift uh, from where we were when we talked about super predators who were gang members and running the streets and you know everybody was going to have to hide in the house. And some horrible laws came out of that and we're still dealing with the impact of those horrible laws where, where young people can't get their records sealed and have other long-term effects that make it really hard. But we're here today to talk about a shift in that, and especially when we look at uh, girls in the juvenile justice system. Crime is down, but the proportion of crimes that are being committed by girls seems to be going up, and it's not because girls are becoming bad or uh, more criminally oriented, it's because our society is criminalizing behaviors that in the past were not uh, dealt with as criminal activity. So for example, you look at the schools and you see that uh, when kids get into school fights, they're now getting arrested. When, when I was in school, you got sent to the dean's office. So we see a lot more uh, girls being arrested um, because of the criminalization of behaviors that may very well be the result of trauma, and we're going to be talking about that. So um, I'm going to move into our first topic, uh, which is viewing uh, through a trauma lens uh, how uh, girls become present in the juvenile justice system. And um, I'm going to ask our panelists, we're going to just have a conversation, just jump in. Um, when nobody's talking, I'll pick on one of you just like law school. Um, but and especially I, I want our young women to uh, participate as much as possible. So um, let's talk about trauma and what it is about trauma that leads uh, girls into the juvenile justice system. And Ashe, did you want to start with that and talk about uh, what kind of trauma girls experience that might lead them into the juvenile justice system? Hello? Oh, great. So I, I'll start with um, a little bit about my background and then ease into a more general perspective. And so um, I am from South LA. Um, I grew up in a single parent home and when I was 12 years old, my sisters and I were removed from the home for child abuse. Uh, around the same time, I had been expelled from middle school for bringing a knife to school, and so I was also introduced to the alternative schooling. I was in continuation school. Um, in alternative schooling, I think I was prematurely exposed to like a lot of the gang violence and the substance abuse. Um, I was considered a smarter student, and so instead of being placed with other middle school students, I was placed with high school students. And um, 
being in foster care and also alternative schooling, I think I had a lot of issues with um, understanding or having a sense of self, a sense of uh, safety. Um, and as a 12 year old going to 13 and 14, um, I had serious substance abuse issues that I really couldn't um, get over. And so at 15, I was facing a murder case. Um, I hadn't been the suspect, well I was a suspect initially because I was protecting my boyfriend who actually committed the murder. And uh, prior to my incarceration, I was homeless. Um, my boyfriend did house me during the time. And so I felt like after he committed the crime, I was in debt to him and I needed to protect him in the courts. And um, I think I was traumatized or the trauma began in the household. And then a lot of the domestic issues I was experiencing translated into my academics and then my behavior was worse. And I, I was in the street life. I was uh, gang affiliated and just leading a life of destruction. And so when I went to court, uh, I don't think they ever really go back into your childhood experiences and kind of look and try to detect where it all began. You know, I think they looked at me and they said, this is a girl who, um, initially, I was really just a witness, you know, but if you want to protect your boyfriend, um, they, you're just as culpable for the crime. And so I think for me, it was really just a chain of traumatic experiences that we never really got to heal. And so I, I think that we gotta start looking through the trauma lens so that we can start looking through a healing lens, you know? So SJ, what kind of trauma um, are girls exposed to? A lot of sexual violence. I think um, in most cases it's um, abuse from domestic partners. And I think what you have uh, when women are incarcerated, they are going to jail for issues concerning partners, you know, um, whether it's d them being a victim of domestic violence and then them reacting, they maybe kill um, their trafficker in some cases if they're being um, trafficked. Uh, they kill their boyfriends or partners if um, they're being abused by them. I, I know personally people who have experienced these things and who are fighting um, life-term cases. I mean, w what do you think the court or the justice system should have learned about you that would have made a difference in how your case was handled? What I questions should they have asked? I had a lot of really deep-rooted issues um, at the time of my incarceration and I think I was crying out in a lot of different ways but no one was really curious about who I was and what I was going through being a, a young girl from South LA, um, just really in the streets, you know? And, and I kind of wanted them to be more interested in my story, you know? And so, I mean, when you get in the courtroom, the judge hardly even takes the time to look up at you from the report and, and connect with you, you know? And I think through trauma at the core of it, of the experience is really disempowerment and disconnection. Mm -hmm. And so, you kind of, you, you seek that time to feel empowered or to feel connected to something, and, but you never quite get there because in the court you feel more silenced than ever. Right. Yeah. Um, Sonia, did you want to talk a little bit about um, how we should be viewing girls through a trauma lens? Uh, yes. Uh, when, when we're talking about viewing girls through a trauma lens, um, it's great to, to look at it in terms of uh, sexual and physical abuse. But where I'm from in New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, a lot of young people have experienced trauma uh, post Hurricane Katrina. A lot of people know that that was a big traumatizing event there in New Orleans. Um, young people in my community are, are traumatized by seeing murders every day. We have a, a very high crime rate. Um, PTSD, young people uh, who, who experience Hurricane Katrina, research shows are 10 times more likely than the general population to to experience PTSD. Um, for young people in foster care, uh, for example, I, I grew up in the foster care system. Um, my mother was schizophrenic. My dad was also uh, diagnosed with a mental illness as well as an alcoholic. When I was placed into foster care, I, I didn't initially feel traumatized by that. I was actually happy with being placed into foster care because I realized where I was coming from was not healthy. But I was traumatized when I was separated from all of my siblings and placed into different foster homes. Because my sister, my older sister, acted as a, a surrogate mother. She was the, the one in the home taking care of 
all of my mom's children when my mom wasn't able to do so. So the, the traumatization came once I was separated. Um, it's, it's more than uh, just sexual and physical abuse. And, and if we just look, look at it as that, then I think we're missing so much. So that's and uh, Haley, did you have something that you wanted to add? Um, I would definitely say that, Ooh, I think that's I'd probably say that um, when I got put into the system, it was for fighting on my mom. And they just looked at me as some kid that was like beating on my mom. Um, my mom is like 5'2", and I am very tall. So they were like, oh, this big kid is beating on her mom. And that wasn't the case at all. My mom would, her choice for discipline was to hit me or et cetera. She would do whatever she had to to get me to listen to her. So I mean, for me, I saw my mom in an abusive relationship for a long time. So how I seen it was that I watched my mom, at the time, I watched my mom get beat for so long that I felt like I wasn't gonna let anyone hit me. I wasn't gonna let someone put their hands on me even if it was my mom. And there was a time that my mom had got locked up for two years. And so I felt like during those two years, I had lost connection from her. I felt like I didn't have a mom. My dad was already, he's a, um, addicted to a lot of drugs. He's never been a president. I was raised by my grandmother when I was six. I got moved to Florida. And so I, my grandma was sort of my parent. And so when I got put into the system, everyone just saw me as like this big bad kid or something. Like I don't really know what it was. I didn't have a, a past of like beating on anyone. I never was a bully. I never like got in <coughs> fights at school, nothing like that. And so they just saw, I don't really know what they saw, honestly but they didn't know that like I've been molested and that I did watch my mom in a bad relationship and that my dad is on drugs and so when I was younger he would come in and out so sometimes I would have a dad and sometimes I see just someone really bad on drugs in front of me. Um, there was times that my mom had to sleep around and sell drugs to feed me and my sister and no one ever asked why I was acting the way I did. They just saw a bad kid um, then I, when I was around 12, when I got put on probation, after already fighting with my mom, we had been fighting for about two years. I, it probably started when I was around 11. And so I got put into Pace. And at first, honestly, I was, Pace is an all girls school. I was like, I don't know if I can do this. It's a lot of girls. And I, you know, girls, everyone thinks drama. So I got put into Pace and honestly, things started to change. My mom actually, I can honestly say she started to be a mom. She started getting the skills to actually parent, even though I did feel like my childhood was halfway over. Um, we started having family sessions. We started actually talking instead of always screaming at each other and thinking that, oh, if we fight, that's our way of like connecting and having conversation. So we got lots of help and things are definitely better now. Um, I feel like in the system, no one ever saw me as me. They didn't ask me any questions about why I was doing what I was doing. They just saw what I did, which I maybe hit my mom back. Or there was a time where, I mean, my mom was trying to get my cell phone, which I was being hard headed and I wouldn't give it to her. And so my mom was pulling my leg and if she would have kept on pulling me off the bed, I would have like busted my head on the ground. So if she's holding my leg, I moved it. And so I kicked her and I got a charge for that. So there's been lots of things that people didn't actually think like, oh, why did this actually happen? Or what was actually happening at the house? So there was lots of times that I felt like I wasn't being listened to. So it got to the point where I stopped talking. So I would just go in front of the judge and they would tell me what I did, even though they weren't there. And I just gave, I just took whatever the um, sentence they gave me. So um, Haley, if you could turn this around, if you were the judge and you had um, Haley before you, what was it that you would have wanted to know and how would you have responded? How did I feel that day? Like what exactly had me feel the way that I wanted to hit my mom? Or not necessarily hit her, but protect myself. I'd probably honestly talk to me. I mean, and you can't ask, even if they did ask the right questions, you can't ask a child questions in front of a whole bunch of people that are already judging the child. They already see this bad child, so they're already treating me like I'm a criminal. And ju uh, Judge Byer, tell us um, about your experience in working with uh, girls who have had traumatic experiences and how uh, you would respond to that. Well, you know, uh, first of all, good morning and thank you. Um, when uh, Judge Groman and I walked in, I said, you know, the most important voices in the room are the room of these young women that have experienced 
um, if you would, the other side of the court system, sitting on the other side of the table. Um, and it's an incredible both burden uh, and an honor to be able to work with uh, youth in the system uh, because the if you're wrong, you're really, really wrong. And so my mantra was really, if I had only known, if I had only known that you were a victim of abuse at home, if I had only known you were homeless, if I had only known your boyfriend uh, was hurting you, if I had only known and fill in the blank. And the truth of the matter is around this country, judges don't know. And uh, cases, hundreds and hundreds of cases and faces come before us. And unless you stop where you are and make a commitment to ask not about the behavior, not what did you do, but why did you do it, then you really haven't done your job and you've really let down the people in the community. I began my work in Louisville, Kentucky in 1996, and I was working primarily in a, um, I worked with abused and neglected kids, but also worked with kids that were status offenders, kids that weren't going to school. And what I'm finding as I'm listening to this group of uh, incredible young women is what was their resiliency factor? What was making, what has made them successful today? And I think what I'm hearing is an education. But we take for granted, and so what's our punitive response in our systems to, to girls that misbehave? We pull them out of school. We pull them out of the school they know. We put them in a school, an alternative school that doesn't meet their educational as well as their emotional needs. We, um, we move families where there's domestic violence to other places and there's disconnect from school and there's no urgency in sense that kids have a civil right to an education and when you get that education, this is really what your saving moment is, is your education. Those of us in this business didn't come about doing this work because our childhood was easy. And I bet if you talk to all of the family court judges, if I talk to Donna, if you talk to me, you'll know that we came about this because we have an obligation to give back to the community. When I was working in Louisville and working at a middle school of high, high what we call high need kids, um, I found that we, we were seeing bad school attendance, but we really weren't addressing the cause. And what do we know that the causes are of kids not getting to school? Um, domestic violence in the home, substance abuse, poverty, no clean clothes, no food, maybe a child translating for a parent. Um, and, and I talk to rooms full of people that haven't committed to understanding this concept, and I say, all right, let's talk about all the reasons kids don't get to school. And we talk about all these things, and I ask them the next question. Which one of these things is the child's fault? And the answer is none of them. And yet we punish the child. And yet we continue to make the youth suffer because their environment has caused the barriers to them being successful. And so the hope is to, like in Louisville, and I started a program where the judges go into the schools and we run a family-based program and we identify strengths, not weaknesses. But you need to understand that it's so important that judges are educated, not about the law. Honestly, the law isn't that hard. I, I'm not trying to be glib here, but it's not that hard. Um, that's why I dropped out of pre-med. Um, <laughs> seriously, I got to organic chemistry and I said, I'm going to law school. Uh, and so, um, so what do you need to know as a family court or a juvenile court or a judge dealing with kids? You, not, you need to know the law, but that's the easy part. You need to know about trauma, the impact of abuse and neglect, homelessness, um, all of these things on, on the brain development, on why kids, um, what else do you need to know? You need to know about special education, individual education plans, substance abuse, brain development, adult substance abuse, adolescent substance abuse, adolescent health. Wait, that's not a judge, is it? That, you sound more like a social yes because you can't divide it and so I think um, 
you cannot make, you have, as a judicial officer, you have an ethical obligation to make good decisions. You cannot make a good decision if you don't know. And so um, part of the support of, of and I hate to say it, the National Council of Juvenile Family Court Judges, where Donna and I live some, and, and with funding for juvenile justice bills, real funding, what we're really talking about is giving those people that work with families and youth and girls, and I have a young girl, she's 23 now, I was telling everybody, this is my description of young women, I love you, I hate you, buy me a dress. Um, <laughs> And, and I say, see, now, so you're somebody that's got girls, right? Yeah, right? And I don't really, and there's other words I could fill in, but I don't know you all well enough. And, and the truth is, I saved all those note, notes that my daughter wrote when she said, you've ruined my life. Remember those notes? See, some of you are going, oh, I sent that to my mom. I hate you. I can't believe you've done this. I really could have, should have. So it really is about empathy. It's about compassion. And it's really about those of us that are in the decision-making business truly believe that kids, all kids, can be successful, and it's our job as adults to figure out what to do to make them that way. Okay, we're just going to take a moment here. Um, we have uh, Congresswoman uh, Sheila Jackson. Um, if you'd like to have her come up and say a few words to us. so very much all of us with three names like to make sure we say Sheila Jackson Lee thank you so very much from Texas and I uh, appreciate it uh, very much let me um, first of all thank my colleagues Congresswoman Karen Bass uh, who we uh, walk uh, hand in hand that I notice that there is a dynamic energy in Los Angeles on a number of these issues and thank you so very much for your leadership and particularly on the questions of foster care which I have now become uh, a glooming and large and uh, ready issue that we all are bringing from our district. So let us thank you. Let's give Congressman Bass another hand. I know. <laughs> and uh, Congresswoman uh, Kelly, uh, who uh, is our respective partner, we won't no longer say partner in crime, partners in <laughs> partner in solutions, uh, and she brings her academic expertise. Dr. Kelly, I want to thank you so very much for your contributions uh, to uh, this nation. Uh, and uh, I like giving women applause, so let's just give her an applause as well. <laughs> we do that so that the Congresswoman will not stand up after three hours of my presentation. Uh, she will <laughs> ignore the conversation as I go on and on and on. And that I will not do. Let me uh, say how excited I am. I I am uh, just uh, moved by the presence of all of you in this room. Uh, and um, I have indicated in my uh, new uh, tenure and leadership, I am the new ranking member of the Crime, Terrorism, and Homeland Security Investigations Committee, the first woman ever to serve in that position since the creation of the Judiciary <laughs> Committee. And my message is to breathe life uh, into the criminal justice system. Interestingly enough, I was on my cell phone talking about, uh, as I was coming into this room and talking to all of you about changing, breaking the shackles, breaking the chains of what the criminal justice system is now. Uh, we recognize that we are in a law and order society, that we must follow the laws, but the criminal justice system is broken, it is shabby, uh, it is unfair, it is without justice and it is particularly unjust as it relates uh, to our young people, our juveniles, and now, as we know, 250,000 girls arrested. Uh, and uh, the stories that I have uh, understand uh, in particular that you have said. So I just want to make uh, these points that you are already aware of. We are writing bills, for example, that deal with police accountability training. The whole question of de escalation, which I just got a summary of what happened uh, to you, I think, uh, in terms of foster care and being arrested for murder. Who am I looking at that had that story? Uh, and uh, let me just say I love you all, okay? Why, why don't I just do that? And, and thank you to the judges that are here. Why don't I just say that we are sisters and we are there for you? I mean, I think that is really, we are no different than you. We wear skirts and pants. Uh, and we've had our ups and our downs. 
Uh, and so um, we, uh, October, yes, okay. Uh, and, um, uh, and so I just want to get that in while I briefly make uh, these remarks and get gaveled down and go to my seat. But I, I'm really moved by um, where we are in the criminal justice system because America's antenna, America's hairs are, are, are on their head, you know, and it's long overdue because we have people who are incarcerated. We have the young man from New York, a juvenile in, incarcerated in a jail, not a prison, at age 16, in isolation for the entire time, beat, finally really, oh, by the way, $3,000 bail, which the family either could never get and then forgot, three years, never came to trial, never came to trial, was released. Two weeks later, he committed suicide. It happens to be a boy, but it is of the age that we are talking about, and girls now face, may I just share these uh, brief statistics with you, which you already, already know, and then just uh, conclude uh, by uh, suggesting that we are in bad shape. Between 1991 and 2003, girls' attentions rose by 98% compared to 29% increase in boys, and girls' commitments to facilities increased by 88% between 1991 and 2003, while boys' commitments increased by only 23%. What is going on here? Mm -hmm. The basic thing that we should understand is that there are no facilities, uh, there are no support systems, jails have no counseling, they have no mental health systems. Let me just broadly say it, I know some may be more innovative than uh, the Harris County Jail, but by and large there is no comfort, uh, there is no pathway, and we have to stop that. It's absolutely broke. And so I'm intending to put together a joint task force dealing with these questions. And might I say as I do that, I am tired of talk. This is very good. I am glad because it gives us information. But are we committed to break these shackles, to be able to hear these stories? Uh, and I know that we're among friends here. I think Karen and our colleagues will say to our Republican friends, this is the session that we must do criminal justice reform. We just can't get out of here this session, the 114th Congress, and be able to go away and not respond to what you have said beyond the social services, Judge, uh, that we need, helping you in the juvenile justice system, we just cannot go away. Uh, so as I said, Cadet Bill deals with uh, recounting of excessive force by police. Building trust is to stop the uh, random stops that people get on streets to build revenue in small communities, so I'm minding my business and I get stopped. It is also to address uh, questions like being picked up for uh, taking a knapsack. Maybe there was $100 million in it, I don't know. But it doesn't seem to me that a $3,000 bail equal or the treatment that you received equal the fact that you were living in circumstances that you could not avoid. Is anybody listening? So I think we need a dual system. We are law and order people. We call 911. But we have to understand that there has to be a parallel system. It is documented that mines are still being developed 18 to 24. So when you see an 18 year old and 24, they go off to war, they do a lot of things. But in actuality, their brains and their judgment is still being formed. Why are they under the criminal justice system when they should be under another system? Why are girls not with girl counselors, if I might say, or an infrastructure of women who are ready. How many women's groups are there in America? If you have a boyfriend or a husband, they'll say, how many memberships are you in? <laughs> there are women here prepared to step into your life. The system does not make a structure. I want to make that structure so that the judge can say, I am so-and-so and so is going to, you're designated to the such and such um, chapter or uh, detail that is associated with the court. I'm not suggesting that the court goes out and runs up and down the street and, and, and calls in women, but let it be a structured process. Let it be secular. We're not, uh, whether it comes from the faith community, but it is secular. And we need to begin to make these kinds of real changes. I close uh, by saying, there are all kinds of things that we're going to be doing and need to do. We should never leave here without sentencing reform, mm -hmm. mandatory minimums, which impact juveniles as well. Uh, we should not leave here without trying to deal 
uh, with the questions of excessive and lethal force. And as we looked at the outrageous video in McKinney, as we respect officers who have fallen in, in the line of duty, I've gone to many funerals, we must also get them to embrace the question and then give the answer. What is the mode of their service? Because that's the first line that you met. Mm -hmm. An officer, I assume, took you in, mm -hmm. and began this process. And so as I speak to police officers, my belief is that we should move from the warrior mentality. Yes. Because we are law abiding. Those who are not, you understand, to the guardian mentality, which allows you to pose questions, to step back, to de-escalate, unarmed, bathing, bathing suit, bikini wearing teenagers. What a different scene that would have been if you were a guardian and not a warrior. Maybe you would not have done a somersault put your knee on the back of a 15-year-old, and just maybe you were interviewing from a Schwarzenegger movie, and we didn't know it. <laughs> My friends, um, I am, um, again, uh, moved by your presence here. There are a number of bills and things that I could carry on uh, discussion about, but I think what I want to say to you is that I will be a listening ear many legislative initiatives we intend to propose and pass. I hope the Joint Task Force will uh, again uh, provide a parallel of listening to people from around the country so that what we do with the juvenile justice system is to breathe life into it and to make sure that it is a reform system that understands the human dignity, first of America, but more particularly of the brightest we have. And that is all of those who fall into that category of first getting up the steps of opportunity, each and every one of you. You are not counting out. You're not discounted. You're not undercounted. You should be overcounted for what you represent to us. And I hope that you will see in the members of Congress their desire to listen, but to act. And I can't act unless I have the pressure of all of you on this body that is the most powerful body in the world. We need to hear from people energized to say we are not going anywhere until real criminal justice reform is enacted, signed by the President of the United States. Thank you all so very much for this. And Karen, thank you. For this.